I'm Neil Sang, I'm a researcher here at SLU in Sweden and I'll be presenting today alongside Polina Savchenko who is a master's student here. The project we're presenting is actually a return to a previous one we presented to IGC a few years ago which is a town called Loma in southern Sweden. The defining features are that while it's very low lying and is bounded on one side by rising sea levels and the other sides by high quality agricultural land, it is also very fast growing and has rapidly industrialised in the last 10 years from being an old fishing and uh, asbestos production town to now a commuting town for Malmo, for Copenhagen and the nearby university town of Lund. As a result, its population is expected to perhaps double by 2050. So the key scenario is to accommodate that population growth while maintaining the town's open and spacious character. And to do that, our students deployed several innovations in terms of flood protection and in terms of flood safe development, which would allow some low density housing while the majority of the population moves into a mixed housing model. Now, the previous project was undertaken by professionals at Loma Municipality and we used the same starting conditions as they were presented with, the same information, the same context, the same evaluation layers, and the same worst case non-adopter scenarios. So they're from the original one. The students then designed towards 2035 and 2050 in terms of the early adopter scenario. And what we can see really is a similar conclusion from what we saw with the professionals, namely that early adoption leads to substantially more optimal outcomes than if one leaves it to later and then changes course in 2035. The evaluation of the designs against the SDGs help us prove the correlation we hope to observe that the earlier the action is taken, the better are the outcomes and the better are the implications for the SDGs. Luma is expected to be affected by future flooding events already in 2035, and it might cause vulnerability to climate-related events, which concerns the fifth target within the first SDG, which is called no poverty. Only the early adopter considers flooding risks in locating of the future housing, the other designs fail to address the risks to the full extent. Therefore, the earlier action is taken, the better are the implications for the SDG 1. Only the early and late adopters pay enough attention to preserving existing green areas, which impact positively not only goal 1, but also 3, 11, 12, 13, and 15. For instance, target number 2 within SDG 12, Responsible Consumption Production, calls for sustainable management and efficient use of natural resources. So by preserving urban green areas, we not only satisfy needs for recreation of the growing population, but also safeguard flood protection and decrease the amount of resources and planning necessary in the future to create such green barriers when they are needed. So analysis according to the SDGs help us to understand the complexity of the design implications and support our decisions towards the most sustainable options for the future. So the benefits that we see in terms of early adoption for the SDG, we also see in terms of carbon capture and the number of trees, in as much as even if at 2035 you can change course and return to a similar number of trees, there's a much greater turnover and therefore the final result is fewer mature trees. So we see the cost of changing direction midway through at 2035. And nature-based solutions that require, for example, trees to mature, they need a consistent political consensus on the direction of travel. The geodesign workshop was two days with Geodesign Hub, and it was one module within a course focused on GIS and landscape analysis. The purpose being to show that the analysis cannot be determinative. It simply informs a broad and negotiated planning process. I think it worked quite well to that effect because we started off with six teams. 
they came up with their own designs, which they then negotiated in pairs to come to three contending designs that were then voted on to go through to the final. They then had to negotiate a common design, but taking into account the rest of the class as the general public, whose opinions needed to be considered. Now, the votes were then taken on that final design as to whether or not it would be supported. And this graph shows the vote for the overall class, which seems like on balance, this would probably um, get through a political process. However, when you exclude the votes of those two teams that were actually directly part of that final negotiation process, you then saw a much more contended result with two camps of different possible directions of travel. And I think that really shows the importance of co-design and inclusion in ensuring that a design has long-term support. Thank you for listening. And I'd also like to thank Polina for helping with the IGC part of this project and the students and staff on Adler, as well as Vishikesh Balal from geodesignhub.com and with respect to the first project, the staff at Loma Municipality. Thank you. Dear colleagues, let me introduce the project called Trees for Florianopolis Metropolitan Region, located in south of Brazil, which include nine municipalities with two different landscapes, as you can see in the images. The requirements for this project are two. Increase 30% of vegetation till 2050 for implement carbon sequestration, as well apply 10 thematic layers as background of area recognition. On the list, it's possible to identify the specific requirements. For our study, the most important was proposal new areas of natural park. For 2035, was considered four innovation ideas, and for 2050, six innovation ideas. The workshop happened in four days. Day one, reading enrichment. Day two, construction ideas for non adopter 2035 and 2050. Day three, construction ideas for late adopter 2035 and 2050, with the goal was increase 30% of carbon sequestration for 2050. And last, day four, construction ideas for early adopter 2035 and 2050. The group used the least assumptions to debate and decide. The results you can see on the images, the construction uh, of action and the concentration was in the urban areas. The rest is considered a green area with the main proposal a natural park. In this slide you can see the result of our geodesign. By the images you can verify in the three, three different times, years, uh, the involvement of our students, PhD students, considering the themes that could be close to our target which was increase 30%, at least 30% of our credit carbon for uh, the parameters that we have in our region. But also, it was not easy to understand non-adopter, late adopter and early adopter in these um, three situations in the platform. So they had to have a bit of time to understand the whole proposal of this exercise related in the workshop. In this slide you can see the result of our workshop and how the students had uh, uh, using their ideas, plotting, policies and projects in our area of study. In fact, the target was reached and we had improved the credit carbon in 31.38% to 2050. The methodology adopted by the students 
were to use GIS platform and they were not an expert. So they decided first use and consider a list of policies and projects in an Excel software where they discussed their real effect for the study area. Late was drawing in the platform the polygons, lines and places where the policies and the projects should be applied. In the Florianopolis workshop you can verify two different areas, coastal and continental each one with different natural aspects, which demand specific actions for implement 30% for carbon sequestration. On the table image, you, it was used different colors for different themes, as you can see. The project participants were managed by Professor Francisco Henrique de Oliveira and also the co-instructor Professor Ana Clara Mourão Moura. Also, we have had uh, uh, support for, from two students, Beatriz Fernandes and Tiago Lima. And uh, the contribution uh, came from nine students which participated in the discipline of multipurpose territorial cadastre and land readjustment. They are related with a PhD course in Territorial Planning and Social Environmental Development from uh, Santa Catarina State University. We have had two lawyers, one architecture, mapping engineer, forest engineer, two geographers, uh, survey engineer, and environmental engineer. Also, the database for this project came from different sources which are listed. The result of this workshop you can verify in these two images, the current situation 2020 and after with negotiated and recommendation plan. As you can see, a lot of green polygons that can implement 30% of uh, carbon sequestration. Hello, my name is Amanda and with Anna and Clara, we will present Landscape Resilience Cache Valley as part of a collaboration between Utah State University and Leibniz University, Hanover. Our study areas in Cache Valley, Utah, which faces numerous environmental challenges and an increasing population expected to double by 2040. Our project objective was to develop and identify strategies and sustainable solutions to make Cache Valley more resilient in the face of population growth and climate change. Our project considered these challenges and other important requirements, including freshwater scarcity and intensifying pollution concerns. Innovations used in our project as strategies and solutions included agricultural water conservation practices and adaptive reuse projects emphasizing mixed uses, among others. Claire will now discuss our methodology. I will start with a part of our methodology. As you can see in the green square on the left, in the GeoDesign Hub workshop, we divided into four stakeholder groups, business people, farmers, landscape lovers, and use you students. In each group, we developed a design proposal that had to meet the targets of each system. And then the final design was negotiated, which you can now see as an early adapter scenario on the right. The plan here is to implement about 120 measures. The most proposed measures came from the residential system. In the late adopter scenario, only 70% of the 120 measures can be implemented as the implementation of the measures starts 15 years later. The non adopter scenario shows how Cache Valley can develop without paying attention to resilience and sustainability, leading to urban sprawl and land consumption. Our evaluation on the SDGs can be seen on this slide. And the metrics of the early adapter scenario shows how the scenario can have a positive effect on the sustainability of Cache County. The late adapter scenario also has a good impact on sustainability, while the non-adapter scenario has a negative impact on the sustainability of Cache Valley due to the lack of ta the target, uh, me targeted measures. Instead of applying a tree analysis, we decided to have a closer look at the resilience of Cache Valley. As Cache Valley is located in um, desert state Utah and already faces water so shortages today, it, um, it is a very vulnerable region in regard of global warming and climate change. 
But also the current pandemic shows that enhancing the resilience of a region plays a major role for sustainable development. The, um, we defined resilience as the ability of a system to maintain its main characteristics despite changing external and internal conditions. Several pro projects and policies such as hospital goes grid independent project from energy infrastructure or the no development in riparian areas policy from water infrastructure system aim to increase the overall resilience in cash value by reducing the region's vulnerability. For the evaluation of the different scenarios, we develop five resilience indicators, which you can see on the left. All over, the early adopter scenario proved to be the most resilient, while the non-adopter scenario shows low resilience. Those matrices again visualize the strong need for action in the valley. Due to the short time, we are going to present only two of the numerous measures we worked out. The first one is an example from the residential system, called New Housing Area in an Old Factory Enrichment. The project aims at transforming an abandoned dairy factory into a modern housing area with single-family apartments, lofts and working spaces. This project also has the potential to attract a lot of tourists in the future. The, th the second example is a pilot project from the water infrastructure system called Water Saving Farming Methods. This project is very important to increase the resilience of the water infrastructure and agriculture systems, which are very strongly affected by climate change. The introduction of water saving farming methods and techniques can significantly contribute to reducing the overall water consumption in the whole area, as agriculture is one of the main water consumers in the valley. This project will be carried out at a as a collaborative project between farmers and user scientists. This brings me to the next slide. As we put a strong focus on creating synergies and corporations between the different systems, we worked out this cooperation diagram. It shows that the systems are very interconnected, especially the residential water infrastructure, energy infrastructure and carbon sequestration systems. In future, those corporations will play a major role in the success of our sustainability strategy. Now I want to thank all participants for their attendance and dedication for the workshop and the project. We believe that by adopting the Hunger 20 measures that focused on densifying housing, water savings, expanding green infrastructure, carbon sequestration, renewable energy and maintaining the agricultural character of the valley, Cache Valley can transform to a sustainable and resilient region by 2050. Thank you very much. Your results for carbon capture do not look promising, even for the early adopter scenario. Is that because Florinopolis is heavily urbanized and short of space or because the population is growing quickly or both? Uh, may I answer? Yes, absolutely. So, well, both of these points are correct. The, the urban area are growing quite faster day after day. And also a bit far from this urban area, we have hills and uh, uh, the result, in fact, to the students, they were not used to put uh, and drawing the whole system and planning using the geodesign platform. They have put all the list in, in, in Excel software, but for them, uh, it was not easier to draw and to put in the system their way of thinking. And this was one of the problems that I could realize uh, and of course affected with the result at all. So I would say that uh, the immature students and the way that they think of planning, of course, had uh, a great impact in these results. Uh, the point of view for this question, it was a good question, is, is one fact and it's correct. The second one is how the students um, uh, behavior with the tools of planning using the geodesign platform. They were not prepared for that. So this impacted with the results too.
Thank you for sharing. Um, another question that I see here is um, from Brian Orlin. It says, Neil and Polina, you had a variety of visual diagrams and metrics, such as the SDGs and the tree carbon measures. Do you have a sense of which source of information had most influence on the voting? I'll take that in the first instance. Um, Polina can add on after maybe. So. The thing, yes, we did have a lot of metrics because when the students finished their designs, they all, we exported their designs to ArcGIS and they all did their own impact analyses on a whole range of different issues, um, not just those for the IGC. So it would have been very interesting to know what would then happen if, if they'd been able to take all those metrics back to another iteration of design. Unfortunately, the way it's set up at the moment this is a, a two day workshop with GeoDesign Hub. So there's no option to then go back afterwards with the metrics, but I would imagine it, it, it probably would do. Um, Alina, do you want to add anything there? No, nothing else. Okay. So I'm gonna read Brian's question, which says, Daniela, your resilience measures are very interesting. Thinking of those alongside the SDGs, should they be considered as an alternative or an additional measure? And I realize that was addressed to me, but I would like to open it up and see if Barty has any thoughts on that first. Uh, thank you, Daniela. Um, I think this is in addition. I think the students felt that the SDGs were too general and uh, they felt that the uh, resilience indicators would tell us perhaps more about what is happening locally. Um, so they spent a lot of time investigating different indicators and trying to find the appropriate ones. Um, and uh, yeah, so this was, I think they go hand in hand. I don't think it's one or the other. I see Carl's finger, Do you, would you like to I'm now advising a, a very, very experienced person who some of us know, but is anonymous at this point in my presentation on, uh, on building a real model of resilience that produces graphic output. And it's in exactly the same terminology as the vertical axis of the parties and Daniela's um, judgmental at this point, I assume, uh, matrix. So there, there's some very serious modeling going on, on trying to deal with the spatial analysis of resilience. And it's, and it's being tested in a large watershed in a European country. I definitely look forward to seeing that the students yeah. ended up using I, the five measures that they used were from Jack A. Hearn and his paper on this. Yeah. So it's got a uh, a landscape history and a literature around it as well. Um, that that, liter that literature is, is is older than Jack's paper, but it but it but it's real. <laughs> it's a very it, it it's a very sensible it's a very sensible classification. It can be judged, and it can be modeled as the models begin to to, to develop. Yes, I'm absolutely. Sure. I, I didn't mean to say that Jack was the. The first, just that that was the particular paper that we had the students read for this project, and I think helped oh, it's inspire good. It's good. the list. It's, good. it's a good paper. It's, a, it's very good. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll say one other thing to that. I think um, so. This was a project where students worked together internationally. So we did a geo design hub workshop online together. The you the German and the American, and the Germans had never seen the American landscape. So they were planning also for a virtual landscape. Um, and it is amazing what kind of information you can glean from the internet. But I think we did this because of the pandemic and we wanted to give them an international experience. But I think also the fact that there was a pandemic and such a disruption of their education and so many other things got them thinking about resilience more and more. So I'm gonna uh, read out another question here. I think this is more of a general one, which says, 
how can negotiated geodesign processes not create situations where some whose ideas did not make it through to the end do not work against the negotiated solution? How can we bring everyone along or is that impossible in highly contested situations? So that would be open to everybody. And I asked it primarily to the point you made, Neil. Um, well, so the specific case in where our vote was, uh, you know, one potentially contended situation. I don't, I mean, the answer is I don't know whether if we'd given them another three rounds of iteration, could they have come to an agreement? There were some pretty strong views on either side as to which which of these two paths would go and and that final vote allowed um, maybe say half of, of one half of that side to to come across and form a majority as it were, whether or not that had been the route to the final third being persuaded. I, I'm not I'm not sure, but maybe the key is less about making sure everybody's 100% happy to making sure that you have a sufficiently large majority that you can sustain a course of action is, is maybe a more realistic, um, more realistic target. But uh, yeah, I thought the last presentations um, workshop flow diagram, the, the kind of the green background um, uh, funneling down to a solution um, made that process pretty clear. And I just have the notion that in negotiation, the only way a project moves forward is that if there's consensus around it, right? So that um, that case shouldn't really emerge that something makes it through to the end that uh, never got out of the one-on-one -on -one and then two-on-two -on -two, uh, negotiations. Because obviously there wasn't, in, in the final poll, there wasn't agreement. So just just kind of sticking with that with that condition or rule or provision for, uh, for negotiating. Yeah, I think if you have enough if you have enough time, that's definitely part of it. Because people, there needs to get around misunderstanding. I mean, that's really the heart of geo design is to make sure that people can see their own angle on on the on what's being agreed. I wonder whether a lot of a lot of what what we do is in rather uh, theoretical circumstances, and it is worth bringing up here the the case of when we did this with the planning professionals. Um, they were much more aware right from the beginning as to what was politically feasible, you know, that they're used to developing within a, 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 some kind of context that they they think is realistic. And I wonder whether or not, therefore, um, how you avoid that kind of self-censorship. Because I remember from the innovations chapter from the book we did from Geodesign a few years back, um, one of the one of the things that came out was that maybe the the innovations that we thought might be used were used less often than than anticipated. So how do you encourage that that boldness of thinking, while at the same time not running up against creating creating positions that people can't get out of? Um, that, that's just part of the the process, maybe really. Carl, I see yeah. your oh. Sorry. Sorry, why don't we go Polina and then Carl? I was just thinking to add a little comment uh, to the project that we were doing uh, during the course uh, with Neil, that uh, from my perspective as I was a student uh, participating in the two-day workshop, and uh, I think it was good that we were like six groups and uh, we needed to come up with the original designs in our groups. But what I felt is that we had a little bit of time pressure and we in the beginning, we felt like we didn't really take time to, uh, to decide which values, which ideas we want to put in the focus. We kind of, we, we tried to come up with something, but we didn't have a clear strategy. But I think there is a good uh, point in like having different groups of people first deciding on different uh, designs uh, with maybe different sets of priorities and values, and then bring it all together and discuss as I think I believe that there is no like wrong solution, but there are always arguments that we can present to uh, to prove whether the solution is uh, feasible in certain circumstance. So I think we it, it's good that we could have uh, 
uh, different groups working with different sets of values in the beginning without setting like the rules in the beginning and then bringing all together and comparing and coming up with the final solution. So kind of like trying to eliminate the chances of some people being uh, so uh, against uh, the negotiated final design so that they want to move forward doing some actions that probably are uh, going against the final decision within the geo design. Carl, I see your finger and then Brian, I'll go to you. I see your hand up and then. You know, we, we, we've seen in this in this meeting uh, two and, and the one before that I was in at least two very different attitudes at the extreme, at the extreme. Uh, I'm, I'm about to begin uh, with governmental officials, a second version of the, of the Oxford to Cambridge one, which has been presented before. And we're going to start in the year 2050 and go backwards to the 2035 uh, one, and then to the existing conditions and what they are leading us to. Ana Clara in the first book said, in Brazil, we can't get any of these 2035 and 2050 ones because people have to eat for tomorrow. Chico, uh, Fernandez is known as Chico to everybody who knows. Chico's presentation today said, we're first going to focus on the non-adopter one with these people we're working with. Then we're going to move them to 2050, and we're last going to do the 20, the, the 2050 ones. And I felt that what he was doing is building a strategy to suck the innovations from the people he was working with, to let them be comfortable in the beginning, and then take them into being, force them in effect, to being more innovative, which they're capable of, but they don't have the energy to do it originally. And I think that's an important issue. Do we presume that people can do this and maybe we should start thinking ahead first and working backwards, or do we realize that maybe they can't and take them slowly along, sucking them into 2050 with innovation? And it's a choice we all have to make. There's, Chico's right. And I think I'm right with the group that I'm gonna be dealing with, but it's a choice and it's a very important choice in running a project. It's a comment, it's not a question, but, but it's something we need to realize. Yeah, absolutely. There are many interesting thoughts about the process itself and the different ways one can go about it. Yeah. Brian, I see your hand up and then um, Annabelle. Yeah, I, I just want to make a, a more general kind of comment. And this is more of a, an advertisement or whatever of what's going to come later, particularly tomorrow, is that, you, you know, the presentations we're seeing have got lots of interesting um, uh, divergences from the, the core IGC model that we've created. And that is all good and it's it's a source of questions. But I wanted to specifically go to Neil's point about innovations. Um, you know, when we initially put together this set of, you know, innovations, it was more with the intent of kind of like making little things go off in people's minds that made them think about the future more. So it's not like it's a prescriptive set that you've got to follow. It's more like a, a source of inspiration. Uh, that said, the kinds of innovations that are occurring in projects, it would be incredibly valuable if we could collect them in some way so that we could then you know, make them a source of inspiration that is much broader and applies to a much wider range of projects. Because you know, to Carl's point, every, every time you do a project and you project ahead to 50 years out in the future, we should be looking for the widest range of inspirations we possibly can, because we know down well, it's gonna be so different to what we're experiencing now. So I just wanna encourage people to be, you know, as we go into this next transition of IGC, we need to back, basically go back and revisit some of the old ideas and retool them for this, for this next phase. So that's the end of my commercial. I will oh, now lower my yeah. hand. Annabelle, how about you? I saw your hand up. Uh, yes, I wanted to make a comment on the on precisely these scenarios that we usually 
are facing, uh, as we said, you know, adopt early adopter, uh, uh, late adopter, non adopter. But uh, it seems to me that it's re required to have, uh, let's say, a review of the scenarios uh, a few years later to see if what we assume would happen with some of the early adopter or late adopter uh, concepts are actually happening, or if the actors, if all these in people involved, government officials, investors, uh, local people, ONGs, even school ideas or concepts have changed in time. Because I think that that, that is actually happening. I, at least from the ones that we've been trying to carry on, we can see one thing that the, all the, the, the proposed ideas or projects that do happen, not necessarily happen as we plan them. They are, they are usually uh, changed or, or uh, adapted to the circumstances. And the other, the other fact that we're seeing is that sometimes through five years or 10 years, the circumstances have changed so much that some of the early adoptions or early assumptions are not valid anymore or have been transformed actually with time. For example, we assume that there will be some population growth and many of the projects we saw this morning said, well, we may double the, the number of people. What happens if five years from now or 10 years from now, the population has doubled uh, earlier or could happen exactly the opposite. The population hasn't grown that fast, but industry has grown faster because these uh, variables are not so controllable uh, just on a, on a planning basis. So I think that's a very interesting thing to, to, to at least to think about these scenarios in time and how that should be indeed reviewed in time. Uh, Neil, I see your hand up. I'm just going to say that certainly this past year of the pandemic has shown us that population growth and where that is happening. Um, I'm not as familiar globally, but I know in the United States, it's been completely upended um, going from urban places where they're seeing currently population declines and parts of rural America where they're seeing growth, um, both from an economic challenge perspective. I mean, I know in Logan, there's families escaping Los Angeles that are moving to Logan and pushing home values up to the point that professors can't afford homes. And they used to be sort of the top class within the city of Logan. So there's been a lot of changes from what we thought were gonna happen to our reality. And that's, I think part of the resilience theme that the students were motivated by is that resilience is when there's this flux, we need to figure out how to navigate that. Um, Neil, I saw your hand up in response as well. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> You'd think after a three month online course, I'd know that. Um, <laughs> some of you might well get an email from uh, Rishikesh and I um, begging for your data because one of the things we're interested in looking at is more probabilistic, looking at the pathways probabilistically at the diagram level. So it's not a whole design, but likely combinations of diagrams into the future give, given the circumstances. And that might even be some lever to Tom's question of how do we get people to come together? Well, it's, if it's not an all or nothing design all in one, but it's sort of, well, this is very likely and that's unlikely. And you know, if it gets really, really bad and the sea really does rise really, ba really badly, then this design is going to come in. You know, maybe people would consent to that because it's partly to do with how much they believe in these scenarios. You know, they might be willing to accept things once they really believe it's going to happen, which, which they're not now. So probability is a fundamental part of, of the design uh, issue as well. For that work, are you guys looking at all at the adaptation planning pathways approach or a route map type element that's, as well? That's, that's the thought way is, is basically looking at different routes and probable combinations. Um, yeah, we'll see. It's just a, just an idea so far, but it's, it's fun. Great. Are there other questions? We have one minute. 
I agree. These were really wonderful presentations. Um, I would ask one last question, which is, um, since my group didn't do it, I'm really curious to hear how effective was the tree analysis? And if you were to do something similar to find a theme, what would you pick that to be? I, I feel like I've spoken a lot, but I should probably answer this one because I didn't do all of the tree analysis. So I was a bit naughty. And basically that was because the town I picked wasn't very representative, so it wouldn't scale up. And I think we need to try and figure out how to accommodate that in the in the design of, of the sort of what we ask people to do. Brian, I see your hand there. Yeah, well, as one of the major instigators of the of the tree uh, sort of focus, um, you know, there's two aspects to it. What one is that it's kind of important to know that what what we do, you know, uh, what the impact is, how big it is. Uh, in general, oh, I see that we're going to have to leave shortly. But you know, um, yeah, the the method is imperfect. I hope we can improve it because I think uh, understanding what our impacts are and how relevant they are to global issues is really critical for us to to you know to understand. Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining this breakout room.